Welcome all to today's Zephyr Project webinar. We are joined by Michael and Peter from Zephyr Platinum member Ant Micro, who will be re presenting Renodepedia. The session is being recorded and the recording will be made available post event. Should you have any questions during today's session, please leverage the chat tool. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Michael to get us started. Hello, everyone. I'll kick it off with a bunch of slides, but I'll try to keep it short to make it more practical. Um, so let me just share my screen. And I assume you can see it now. So let's kick off into slideshow mode and get started. So yeah, the title today is, you know, Renodepedia from Zephyr Structured Data to Traceable and Testable Open Hardware. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna tell you about Renodepedia and how it came about. For a little bit of background, um, our company at Micro is, you know, working with lots and lots of hardware. And this hardware is very diverse. It spans across, you know, ARM, is 5 other architectures. We will work with MCUs, but also application processors and GPUs and FPGA hardware, dedicated accelerators. So lots and lots of different kinds of hardware. And of course, this is a very complicated landscape with a lot of diversity and a lot of work to get it all to work together. But the entire company is built around the concept of open source, open source hardware, you know, getting things to work together and understanding how they work. Uh, and Renode as a tool that lies at the kind of ground of, of uh, Renodepedia was actually an internal tool that we originally created to increase our understanding of this hardware ecosystem, to have an edge, to be able to, you know, work faster and more efficiently with uh, different kinds of platforms. Uh, and then we thought, okay, it's a great tool. Let's let's make it, you know, available to everyone. And uh, we open sourced it. And indeed, it was, you know, of course, a great idea. It continues to be a huge part of our open source hardware story. And I'll explain how. Um, so Renode, in very brief terms, uh, we're going to show it to you in practice a little bit later. But uh, just to 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 give you a little bit of understanding of what it is, it's an open source software agnostic hardware simulation framework. And some people just say, look, it turns your hardware into software. It helps you run your hardware in your computer. And indeed, today it's being used to help build, you know, spacecraft and robots and self-driving cars, wearables. You might perhaps be wearing something that was built using Renode and you don't even know it. But generally speaking, it's being used to develop practical products. And the important thing to know about it and the thing that we'll kind of be using to, to show you, you know, how this all connects together is the fact that Renode is a building block based simulator. It's, it's based on the concept of how structure is actually built when it's created. And then of course it tries to mimic that kind of structure to provide different kinds of benefits. And of course it's open source, so you can grab it from GitHub. Then of course the second secret ingredient is Zephyr and Zephyr is, as you probably know, a multi-platform and multi-vendor RTOS. It is a huge ecosystem, a great community, and uh, we're a big fan. We're a big supporter. Uh, we've been around for a very long time. We're also a Platinum member now. And we're working to apply Zephyr in practice, building real applications, integrating it with other frameworks, porting it to new platforms. That's the kind of work we do. And uh, the important thing to, to understand about Zephyr is that it also has structure. And it is trying to achieve a pretty similar goal to what Reno is trying to do, which is trying to understand and to catalog and, and find good abstractions amongst the hardware of the world. Because if you're gonna support an operating system across a variety of uh, different architectures and vendors, you'll need to find those abstractions. You'll need to put them into code. You'll need to make them easy to work with and create tools that will allow you to work with these abstractions efficiently. And that's what Zephyr is doing. So in general, it helps you kind of understand hardware in a structured way platform agnostic. Uh, so if we add two and two together, we get Renodepedia. That's the topic of today's webinar. Um, I'll, I'll call it the soon to be, you know, ultimate hardware resource. I think already today is pretty useful, but we're kind of trying to make it into something that's really, really kind of comprehensive and, and useful to people. Uh, we'll tell you a little bit about how it came about and how Zephyr was instrumental in building it. And uh, just kind of to set the stage, the primary goal of Renodepedia was to understand hardware better, to allow you to kind of see how it's structured, to also make it possible for, for people to experience hardware firsthand 
without actually having to source, you know, a board. You, you don't have to kind of go to a shop and buy it, have it shipped to you to try it out. Um, and of course, like uh, it's easy when you're talking about one board, but if you're trying to kind of scale across the entire hardware ecosystem, it becomes obviously impossible to have each and every board physically on your table. Whereas Reno, the Reopedia allows you to do that and Zephyr, of course. So yeah, uh, to give you a little bit of more like personal motivation for how Renotepedia came about, uh, I call it the Euphopedia of hardware. And uh, for, for those of you who don't know, a Euphopedia was this kind of internal encyclopedia in a video game called UFO Enemy Unknown or XCOM UFO Defense. It had two names, different in America, different in Europe. Uh, generally speaking, this game was all about, you know, fighting aliens and um, to, to fight them, you had to obviously build a team and, and get some weapons and build some buildings and so on and so on. You did research, you found out what aliens kind of looked like and how they behaved um, and so on and so on. So over the course of the game, you built up better understanding of the in-game world to try to figure out how to, you know, crack it, how to kind of win. Uh, so Renopedia or Ufopedia uh, at that time, it was... Uh, this thing that I used to browse for hours, kind of looking through different kinds of parameters of the you know, weapons or uh, looking perhaps at the different alien species that I would kind of encounter throughout the game, trying to figure out, you know, a strategy, immersing in the game's content, uh, comparing different parameters and so on. Uh, and this kind of feeling where you browse an encyclopedia of, of kind of interesting stuff, uh, whatever, of course, is interesting to you. Hopefully, the people joining this webinar are interested in hardware. Um, so you would browse this, you would kind of feel uh, very much at home. Uh, you could spend hours uh, kind of looking at this fascinating world that the game designers uh, built for you. So, so this feeling that I had, you know, browsing Ufopedia was something that came back to me those many, many years later, like 20 years later, while thinking about, okay, how do we use all this data from Zephyr, from Reno, like what can we do with it? And, and we thought, okay, let's, let's build an encyclopedia. Let's build one that you can actually browse and kind of learn from and experience this feeling. So I was very happy about the analogy, but uh, I never shared the analogy of the world. So I never told anyone, hey, I, this is the, the way that I kind of came up with the idea. Uh, but I, I just recently, just this week, he heard a perhaps more of like actual, uh, more current uh, version of this, this angle. So uh, I was recording a podcast, Better FM, that's early later today, and uh, someone from the audience actually asked, hey, can you tell us more about Renotepedia or the Pokédex of hardware? And that was really funny because in, in some sense, you know, Pokédex from Pokémon uh, is, is kind of uh, an encyclopedia of all the weird creatures that you can find uh, in this world. So it's kind of similar in its concept to, to Ufopedia originally, right? It's uh, got uh, uh, those, those creatures and their statistics and what they're good at and what they're not good at. And uh, the Pokédex helps you navigate this world, understand how it's structured and which creatures can turn into which ones and so on. I'm, I'm not a like, huge Pokémon geek, of course, but I thought it's a great analogy. It's a, it's a very nice uh, kind of uh, um, way to summarize very briefly what Renotepedia is trying to be is the Pokédex of hardware. So I guess it's official now. We have to put it in the subtitle for the web page. Uh, yeah, uh, so that's kind of the, the intro in terms of slides. Uh, but of course, like uh, there's much more to be said. I'd rather kind of go and show you a little bit of things more practically. So I'll start with Renotepedia as such. That's, that's the main screen. And this screen kind of, just shows you the categories we have here. So immediately you'll see that, you know, this is categorized knowledge. Uh, there's a few different uh, avenues that you can explore. There's a list of features down there that you can kind of immediately jump to. I'll, I'll walk you through the features in a second. And um, well, obviously Zephyr is concerned with boards. And if you're building practical hardware, you typically start with okay, let's grab a board, let's try to put something on the board and see what happens. So boards is the natural place to start. And if you go there, you'll see lots and lots of different boards. Um, and these are kind of all the boards in Zephyr or almost all the boards in Zephyr uh, currently, which means several hundreds. Uh, and all those boards are kind of, if you look at this little icon on the right, they're marked whether you can simulate them in Renode or not. 
But that's an important aspect that we'll get to in a second. Let's pick one. I'll, I'll actually pick one that I know is kind of fun to, to take a look at. And uh, uh, let's kind of, uh, yeah, let's try this one. Um, so if you actually click on the, one of those boards, you'll see a screen that, and one of the tabs here is software. And of course, as you can imagine, is different types of software that can run on top of the board. Uh, th these are actually five different demos of Zephyr. So this is all Zephyr software. Um, and starting from Hello World, which as you can guess, prints Hello World to the console through uh, the shell module that allows you to kind of interact with the Zephyr shell, Philosophers, which is a typical kind of uh, um, concurrency problem uh, that Zephyr has as a demo. Then there's TF Lite Micro, which is an AI library, a, a microcontroller machine learning library that we helped kind of port into Zephyr and make it work together. And MicroPython, which many of you might be familiar with, which of course allows you to uh, run some Python on your board. And all these demos are, you can click through them, they should have an analogous structure on the first one. Uh, and uh, all of these demos, the important thing to understand about them is that all of them can be run on the majority of Zephyr boards, which is important for us because we're trying to, you know, target as much hardware as we possibly can. So that's why the demos don't include hardware that, you know, there's no CAM demo because probably most of the boards in Zephyr don't have CAM, et cetera, et cetera. And of course you could imagine lots more different kinds of software that we could enable here, but those five are a very good start. So um, taking uh, this hello world under our microscope here, let's uh, kind of see what we have here. Uh, first of all, you, there's some instructions on how you would actually go and run uh, this demo, meaning this software in simulation, locally on your computer. We're not going to do it now. Peter will show later how it's done. But just kind of uh, uh, as a first thing, you can just reproduce all the results of Ringo PDA yourself. And, and that's very useful. Uh, then, of course, we have something even cooler that Peter will also show later, which is you can even run this directly in the browser. You don't have to install anything. Just click this button. You'll go to a special space, uh, a server that will spin up for you, and you're, you're going to be able to run Renode in your browser. Well, actually, on a cloud machine somewhere, but you'll see the results in your browser, and uh, you'll be able to interact with this. Then there's some really cool stuff, which is the output of the CI that we regularly run to generate the results that build Renodepedia. And so one of them is the output of the UART in this demo. So you remember, this is the Hello World demo. So as I mentioned, it prints out Hello World and tells you the name of this board. There's the Zephyr version, and so on and so on. Generally speaking, this, this is just a, a cinema screencast of the UART. We can generate those from Renode. So you can basically run some kind of a simulation, any kind of board, and just generate that output uh, from Renode as an ASCII cast. And so here we're just showing that for people to show them, hey, look, the demo really runs. There's the output. Um, there's also a trace. Peter will tell you more about this later. But this is the trace of the execution of this actual binary in simulation. And you can see here, you can actually kind of browse it and, and click through it and you know see uh, uh, what things are happening and so on. Of course, like if you run this locally, you can also scale this up and take a deeper look and so on. But this trace is, is just to visualize for you that this data is available. And then you can also download all the artifacts that uh, have been created in our CI build. Uh, you can download all the Renode files and all the binaries. Uh, there, there's plenty of stuff that will get there. You can download SBOM data for this demo. So uh, a direct kind of rendering of what kind of bits and pieces software-wise go into the actual software that you're running. Uh, SBOM is a huge thing, and we're also talking about how Renode kind of and Renodepedia and Zephyr correspond to, to another topic, hardware bomb, which we're also working on. Uh, and generally speaking, you know, accounting for you know what you're actually running and, and how it uh, behaves and why and how it's related to other things is a huge chunk of, of what Renodepedia is all about and, and a very important aspect for Zephyr too. And at the very end, you have uh, robot test suite logs. Robot is something we use for testing, so you can kind of take a look at the actual keywords that got executed in this test. So when we're running this, this Hello World demo, we're kind of trying to make sure that demo works, that whatever needs to be printed out here 
actually does get printed out, not just by visually looking at this uh, ASCII mind and seeing whether the right thing is here, but we actually have, you know, auto-generated robot test suites that test that, and here you can see the result. So overall, this is the board screen. And as you can see, it already has quite a bit of the information there. Now, uh, there's some other interesting things here. Uh, you can essentially go to the specific system on chip. And if you go there, you'll start seeing uh, the second uh, group of information that we have in Renopedia, which is information about system on chips. Um, like kind of uh, an interesting bit of trivia is that those chip enclosures you should see here are also actually auto-generated by RCI. We're working on, you know, a, an open kind of hardware uh, uh, encyclopedia common component library and so on. And uh, we're kind of looking at how to automate that so that it doesn't have to be like designed by hand or we don't have to source those images from specific vendors and so on. Uh, if you look at the this kind of uh, screen where you have the NRF 52840 from Nordic, uh, you'll see a lot of different components here on the system bus. So this chip has a lot of different bits and pieces. And of course, some of them are a little bit more interesting than others. Uh, specifically in this table, you'll see where they map into the system chips address space. And uh, perhaps more importantly, you can also see what kind of peripheral they represent. So those building blocks are actually different kind of IO peripherals or, or clocks or timers, you know, inside the chip. And so being inside the chip, you can see, you know, what's, what it's built of. And some of them will have some links. And if you look at the link, it actually goes to Renode and goes to wherever in Renode this thing is represented. So if you go to this link that I just opened, this is the UART. This is the actual model of the UART in Renode. Uh, but also, of course, uh, importantly, you have another link, which is going to Zephyr, and we're gonna, we can show you where the driver lives. And of course, like all this is uh, a little bit magical because, you know, uh, suddenly you can see the entire map of the SOC, uh, and you can see what it maps to in terms of Renault models and in terms of the Zephyr drivers, and so on and so on. Uh, but the the magic behind it is kind of simple if you explain it. We're going to try to do that in the second part of the webinar. So just bear with us here. Um, and of course, uh, in this SOC, you can also see that there's quite a lot of boards that support it. And you can jump between those boards and you know, kind of even click another board. And uh, you can take a, take a look at uh, you know, other similar boards to it. Uh, you can kind of go to what the device tree for this board looks like. Uh, and so on and so on. Peter will kind of tell you a little bit more about all those different uh, aspects of, of Renopedia, all the data that it generates, how to generate it yourself and so on. Now, uh, in the peripheral screen that I showed you before, um, you can also kind of click on one of those peripherals. So if you go to this UART specifically, that's the third bit, right? We're in hardware blocks now. And this is like a specific IP core inside a specific SOC. Uh, and as you can see, this is being used in a number of SOCs, right? Different kind of Nordic SOCs, obviously, because it's their UART. And it's also being used in quite a few boards, right? And you can see that it's a serial port and it has a Zephyr driver and a Renault model, as I showed before. So overall, you can kind of go and, you know, browse these things and, you know, click on different boards and, and move between the demos and, and play things and uh, look at different pieces of hardware, explore their, uh, parameters and so on and so on. So there's plenty of uh, uh, depth there. And we're, of course, working on adding more. Uh, because one thing I didn't show you is like you have a list of vendors. You can go to a specific vendor and perhaps investigate what kind of boards and SOCs this vendor had built. Perhaps we'll take ST, who's a very popular vendor. And as you can see, the list of boards is humongous. They have a bunch of SOCs. They have quite a large number of hardware blocks, again, we, we're marking which ones are supported in Renode. So overall, there's quite a lot of depth. You can kind of browse it for, for quite a while. Uh, obviously, it's not just about browsing. Obviously, it's also about actually trying to run and experience some of these things. So if we go to you know, one of those boards there, um, again, probably what you're going to be eventually most interested in is this screen, which is you know, how to run different kinds of software uh, that we know run because we've generated all this in Renopedia. We're showing those results. We obviously know that we're able to reproduce this if we want. 
And I guess at this point, it's best if I transition to Peter, who will try to show you in a little bit more detail on how to actually do all this. Sure. Uh, let me take over the screen sharing. Uh, I hope you can see my screen now. Uh, yeah, it should be okay. Uh, so, uh, as Michael uh, said quite a few times today, uh, everything around Queen.pedia relies on data, and I will try to show you how do we get this data and where do we get it from. Uh, first of all, uh, let's take a look at what kind of data do we have. Let me scroll all the way down to the artifacts part. Uh, let me download it and I will open it in the terminal. Uh, my uh, console will help me. Oh, will help me or not? Uh, Arduino. Okay. Uh, so uh, these are the artifacts that I downloaded for a specific demo uh, on uh, running on Arduino Nano 33 BLE, which has a Nordic chip. Uh, and I will try to just iterate over what we have here. So first of all, we have three SPDX files, which are the SBOM files uh, for different stages of the, the um, application uh, lifecycle, let's say. Uh, we have things that you will all be familiar with, like config. The config file is the, just the Zephyr config which, uh, with which the application was built. Uh, we have a device tree uh, that Michael showed uh, before. Uh, we have several files that I will not cover now. HTML is the test results that Michael showed, but uh, to, to the rest of these files, I will come back in a second. Of course, we have an ELF file, which is the application itself. So a specific demo built for a specific target uh, and the build lock uh, if we need to verify if, for example, our build went wrong. Uh, or uh, something like that. So the question is, uh, where does Renotpedia take this data from? Uh, now enter Zephyr dashboard. Uh, Zephyr dashboard is an, in short, it's a massive CI system that we created uh, specifically for Zephyr and it was enabled by the Zephyr capability to build things in a uniform way. Uh, and yeah, as Michael mentioned, we are building uh, Zephyr for five samples that are uh, easy to build for most of the platforms. So Hello World, Philosopher's Shell, TF Lite Micro and MicroPython. And we build it over the uh, long range of uh, available uh, boards that are in Zephyr. And in this first um, matrix view, you can see uh, that yeah we'll have of course many uh, boards that are building and passing we have some that are only building but are not passing tests in renote uh, there may be many reasons for that maybe we just don't have the specific models for peripherals uh, but some samples are not built at all and there might be different reasons for that as well uh, maybe the application requires some features that are not defined for a specific target uh, maybe the application doesn't fit on a specific target, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, here we have like a very long uh, list of demos, and for each of these demo, we can, for example, run uh, the a cinema output that Michael showed before, um, and we can of course download all the artifacts, see the test results, etc. Uh, we can also go to uh, details of a specific uh, application. Let's start with Hello World. Uh, here you also see some uh, statistics, some summaries. So we managed to build uh, Hello World for all of the tar uh, hardware targets that we tried. Uh, we uh, managed to run it successfully in Renote for over 200 targets and for uh, less than that, for less than 200, uh, we didn't have passing tests. And of course, the reasons for that might be uh, might be uh, varying. So for example, we don't have support for specific architectures or just we don't have models, uh, which is fine. We're trying to increase this number uh, constantly and it, 
is generally going up. Uh, if you go to a more complicated uh, sample, you see that, of course, the uh, amount of uh, platforms that are not built increases. Uh, but generally, we keep over half of the supported targets working in Renode. Uh, so one thing that is also uh, presented by Renode dashboard is the details of how did we uh, build and what did we build uh, and how did it test. So here we have a Reno version that uh, was run, uh, that the, the, the tests were run against. And we have the version of Zephyr. Of course, both Reno and Zephyr are projects that uh, evolve quite quickly uh, and they change constantly. Uh, so with this CI setup in place, uh, our idea for the next step is to distribute it, distribute this uh, uh, this workload in in the cloud and test more Zephyr revisions. So let me go here. Uh, this is a repository that we have on our GitHub. You can uh, take a look at it if you want. It's called Zephyr Testing GCP, and it does exactly that. It tests Zephyr using the similar workflow that we have in dashboard uh, on GCP. So what you see here in this very small, uh, uh, unreadable uh, graphics is actually tons of jobs that we have for uh, the CI. May, let me zoom a bit. Of course, when I share the screen, uh, it doesn't work as smoothly as it should. Uh, but in short, it runs uh, tests for 30 latest Zephyr commits. And for each of these commits, a new machine is spawned to test a specific sample on this Zephyr commit. So we you can see that we have Hello World, MicroPython, Philosopher, Shell, and TF Life Micro. Uh, the number zero means current head uh, minus zero, current head minus one, etc. And when the build passes, we uh, go to the simulate phase where we try to uh, take the built artifacts and run against all the uh, uh, and run all of them in in uh, Renode against the tests that we cre created. And afterwards, we gather the results here. So this is still a uh, work in progress. So I can't show you uh, great looking summaries uh, of historical data in Zephyr. Um, but the idea is to have uh, insight into Zephyr development into Zephyr evolution, uh, we will be easily e easily able to detect if uh, maybe Zephyr is growing and some samples stop uh, fitting on specific platforms, or maybe just uh, Renode support is getting better and uh, our coverage increases. Uh, so there are many, many different uh, things that can be discovered from this kind of output, uh, and we're quite eager to uh, see what comes out of it. Uh, yeah, so this flow is very similar to what we have uh, in dashboard. Uh, so one thing that we mentioned quite a lot today is that there are many platforms that are supported in Zephyr, uh, supported in Renode, sorry. Uh, what does it mean to be supported in Renode? First of all, we need models. Uh, we need models of peripherals, we need models of the core itself to execute the code, uh, but we also need two specific files. One is called, uh, let me get back to the output that I downloaded, one is called RESC and one is called REPL. Uh, maybe let me show it in, in a browser. Uh, so I will open uh, files that uh, contain descriptions of the RESC and REP file for the NREF52840 as it is supported in upstream Renode. And I will just try to give you a very brief overview of what these uh, files do. So let me start with the RESC file, which is Renode script. Renode script is responsible for creating the environment, for setting up all the uh, bits and pieces for the, the emulation to work. Uh, so focusing on the most important part, first we create a machine, then we load a platform description from the rep file, uh, which I will cover in just a second. Then we load the binary. 
so in Zephyr dashboard, we build all the binaries in the CI, but here we can also point to a binary that's available on the internet. So for example, in this case, we download some Zephyr shell sample for this uh, demo. We can open some UART windows if we want to uh, inspect the UART output, or we can do other connections. We can connect boards together, etc. We load the uh, we load the the binary, and then we just run the simulation. So the idea is very simple: create machine, load the platform description, load the binary. Uh, as you can see, there is nothing very specific to the Nordic platform. It can be easily uh, generalized uh, towards you know, supporting other platforms. And then let's go to the REPL file, which is a REPL for Renode platform. Uh, and this one was loaded by the REST file I showed you just a second ago. Uh, and what we have here is uh, the description of the SOC itself. So we have some nodes. In this case, this is UART, which is of some type. It's connected to the system bus at a specific address. It has some parameters. It has some interrupts connected, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have actually for for non, uh, the NRF 52840, we have quite a few uh, blocks defined. So so the platform has a very nice support uh, in Renode. Uh, yeah. So as you can see, uh, the list of blocks is pretty long. Of course, this should be immediately similar to uh, some other type of data that we already discussed today, that is the device tree. So if I open the device tree, I can see that it contains very similar information. There are some blocks that are of specific type and they are available under a specific address, which is actually defined here. And they might have some Uh, properties. So uh, while Renode does not support device trees directly, we can see that there are many similarities in the at least spirit of this uh, file type. So uh, yeah, this is something that uh, can be uh, easily, well, maybe not easily, but should be possible to translate from uh, one format to the other. Uh, and of course, that's one, what we wanted to uh, do for the Zephyr dashboard. The point is that Zephyr provides all of this data, so we don't have to generate it manually. The file that I showed you on GitHub, this is handcrafted. This uh, We were working with the uh, NRF52840 for quite some time, and we created this platform manually. But we would like to take this data that someone else created and just create a platform that works in Renode. And we have a tool for that. It's called DTS Trap. Uh, it's also available on our GitHub. If you go to Antmicro DTS Trap, there is a repo uh, that you can download. And it's a very simple script, uh, Python script that uh, yeah, takes the device tree and tries to generate a file from it. And I will show you how to use it. And there will be some uh, things that we need will need to solve. Uh, let me start by uh, finding the proper uh, platform. We will focus on Arduino Nano 33 BLE Sense. Uh, so let me find it. Uh, Arduino Nano BLE DTS. Yeah. So this is the file. Uh, this is a device tree file, and as you can see, it's not very. Uh, well, it's not populated with data, it just contains includes. And funny thing about these includes is that they are not necessarily very standard way of including files in, in device tree. And for example, if you try to use the DTC uh, compiler to well, consume this file, you will just get syntax errors. Uh, yeah, so the idea is that we need to take this C style uh, includes and uh, resolve them. And that's, of course, something that we can do in our DTS to REPL tool uh, if you want to implement uh, the same logic uh, again and again. Of course, it has been implemented by many other tools, so we might just use them instead. 
Uh, so let's start with uh, trying to uh, take uh, trying to take this device tree and making it flat. Uh, for that, we will use GCC. And yeah, I ho hope that uh, my uh, console will help me uh, better this time. Uh, yeah, I will write a quite a cryptic command, uh, but uh, you will see why in a second. And let me just copy the file name, and that will be it. Um, what am I trying to do to here? I'm taking, I'm running GCC on my device tree file, but I only want to pre-process it. That's the capital E. I don't want to uh, the preprocessor to print out additional line information, which would mess out my uh, output. But I would like to know which files the preprocessor uh, pre visits. And yeah, I can provide it with some file type that makes it uh, possible to, to analyze the DTS file for some reason. Assembler with C CPP is of course not the, the correct file type for DTS, but it works, so let's stick with that. And when I run this command, it tells me, of course, that, yeah, I need to provide an include directory. Uh, for Zephyr, and yeah, I wanted to do it manually just to show you that the because Zephyr is very well organized, uh, it's relatively easy to just come up with proper entries. So we're looking for uh, um, some DTS size, so, so an overlay uh, device tree specific for Nordic. It will be in DTS slash ARM. Okay, now we are looking for memh. This will be in DTS slash common. Now we need something ARM specific, like just ARM v7m. Uh, Actually, it is in DTS ARM, but the path requires us to add just the DTS directory. And the last one that we will fail is just an include file that this specific uh, device tree tries to uh, analyze. So I'll just add include. So, and this is a common pattern for all of the platforms that we run in uh, Renotpedia. You provide uh, include directories for DTS slash architecture, DTS, DTS slash common, and include directory. Yeah, and it gives us a flattened device tree with tons of data that we now are able to parse. So let me first uh, drop it to a file. Uh, I will get back to these output just in a second. So right now we are able to run uh the dts repl file on this flat dts uh, i can maybe open it just to show you that it's a, just a regular dts file nothing fancy here uh so dts to repl flat dts and in, as a result i get the output rep file uh, it tells me that it's auto generated which is of course true in this case and yeah it looks reasonable right it has some blocks, the interrupts are connected. Uh, yeah, most of things are here. Not everything is here. Uh, there are some, there is some data that we can't simply extract. Uh, we definitely, uh, well, we can analyze, uh, well, maybe let me phrase it other way. Uh, there are some things that are not in device trees. And there are some things that are just not yet implemented in DTS to REPL. So some details might not, might be available in these files, but we are not able to extract them yet. But let's look at the files that are starting with dots. These are the include files that uh, GCC visits. So there is some Nordic specific stuff. There is ARM specific stuff. Of course, first of all, we start with the Arduino BLE uh, sense file. Uh, so these files, uh, can point us to overlays that we implemented in DTS rep. Let me show them. Uh, DTS rep overlay. Uh, the list is not very long. So these are all the overlays that we support right now. And yeah, it allowed us to, to have this uh, hundreds of platforms running uh, in, in a dashboard. So we basically uh, rely on, on generic stuff. 
Uh, but of course, creating these overlays is still manual work, uh, but it's still much easier to just create an overlay for all ARM v7 platforms than to do it manually for each and every file, uh, for each and every platform that we want to support. So uh, going back to this file, yeah, we, we analyzed the Arduino Nano DTS file. We are analyzed some Nordic stuff and ARM v7. These are the important ones that are in this output. And if you look here, we have one for Arduino, we have one for ARMv7. We don't have anything for Nordic because we are able to generate everything uh, automatically. What are in these files? So uh, let me start with the ARMv7. Uh, actually, yes, to have. Oh. Um, I think for the seven. sake of speed, we can kind of yes. uh, skip parts of this. Yeah, all right. Uh, oh, yeah, I see that we're close to the uh, finishing time. So, uh, yeah, what we need to do is we just take these these two uh, overlays and we provide it as a parameters to the TS to wrap. TS to wrap overlay, we provide them with comma separated value, uh, separated by commas. Uh, and yeah, this is the uh, result. Uh, at the top, we see that this part is auto-generated. This part is taken from single, one of the overlays, and this part is taken from the other. Uh, yeah, and this is actually uh, the main source of data that we uh, that we use to generate Renote Media and uh, Zephyr dashboard. Uh, of course, it's not uh, not everything. We also analyze some documentation found in Zephyr, uh, so there is a lot of information that we can extract. Uh, just from uh, analyzing uh, Zephyr structure and the way it's 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 formed. Uh, one last thing that I wanted to show is, as Michael mentioned, um, let's get back to uh, to this page. Uh, Renode Run. Renode Run is uh, the easiest way. If you have Linux, you can just install a very simple Python script that will take care of downloading Renode and running the samples uh, locally. Uh, unfortunately, when I'm sharing the screen, it acts, it uh, is a little bit slower than usual. Oh, it actually uh, was pretty fast today. So uh, I have uh, Reno Run already installed, but you can see that I just provided it with the platform name and with the demo name. And when I run start now, I can see the URL output interactively, I can play with, I, I am running the same binary you would normally run on uh, reg, uh, on actual hardware in simulation uh, without any additional changes, no, no instrumentation, etc. There are many other things that we could uh, discuss uh, from Renotepedia. Uh, I don't think we have uh, time for collapse, uh, but you're welcome to just click on one of these uh, links and to run the same demo uh, in Google Cloud. Uh, the uh, the uh, traces that we generate allow you to uh, interpret uh, the actual flow of the application. And if you download artifacts from uh, from this build and you look into the script, you will see a command that will allow you, allow you to generate it yourself and open it in an application called SpeedScope. We also have a new blog note on our blog describing all this process, uh, this whole process. So uh, feel invited to just take a look. Yeah, I believe I will uh, give the screen back to Michael. I think uh, it's we're not so you know so so short on time. So I think collapse we can fit that in, and then we'll proceed to questions. Uh, okay, I'm not. I hope it will just work. All uh, right. So if you click on a collapse, this is what you see. Uh, this is a Jupyter notebook. Uh, let me try to connect. Today, Google, Google told me about some uh, quota limitations that they're uh, observing today, but hopefully it will just run. <clears throat> and what we do here, we generally down, uh, download Renode Run uh, just to deploy Renode and some additional Python, uh, Python modules to be able to talk. Oh yeah, I know it was not authored by Google, it was authored by me. Uh, additional tools that allow us to uh, talk to Renode from this uh, Python environment in Jupyter Notebook. So right now we have a 
machine spawned in GCP somewhere. Uh, it's installing the uh, required tools. It will install robot framework, which we use for testing and actually for talking to Renode uh, in this specific context as well. Let's download the Renode. It's 56 megabytes, so it's depending on Google bandwidth, yeah, of 54. Uh, now I will connect to, to Renode and the way we do it, we get new Python methods that we are able to call from our scripting that we usually use for testing. So we can control the emulation itself. Uh, we can execute some Renode commands, but we can also, for example, wait for events to happen, wait for something to happen on the UART or just for the simulation to pause. And here we have a sample script. Uh, this is the very similar to what I showed you before. Uh, we load some platform description, let rep file from the internet. We enable some pro additional profiling, re record output to a cinema. Uh, yeah, and we load the binary. So let me run it. Uh, in this specific case, we load the script. Uh, we open a tester on uh, one of the UARTs, start the emulation, and then uh, wait for a line to appear on the UART. So this does not do, uh, show much. It just showed that it's completed execution uh, because it's just uh, like a batch test. But you can see the output from the S cinema that we created in a second uh, in the script. Yeah. Well, that's not surprising, but it's also satisfying that it works as a intended. But what is interesting is the metrics that we can gather from this run. We don't display traces here because we are still uh, implementing that, but we have some interesting metrics that we can display. So for example, the amount of executed instructions. Well, this is hello world. So basically it just starts executing at the beginning and then you know uh, waits for interrupts. Memory accesses and specific peripheral writes. So here you can see that there's a search at a very short time and then it does nothing. Uh, and yeah, exceptions that are uh, seen by the application. And all of this data is, is gathered without any additional instrumenting of, of the code, any uh, changes to, to the platform. It's just a matter of clever scripting that we do uh, in our REST files. Uh, yeah, I believe that's uh, that would yeah. be it for now. So thank you. I think we're kind of mostly yeah. Almost right on time, so let's let's just kind of transition to the Q and A bit because I can see there's quite a few questions. I'll I'll get back to screen sharing just to give you guys the the links that um, we've been kind of talking about. And uh, yeah, Peter, perhaps you could kind of go to the chat and, and start answering questions. Yes. I think they're really good ones. Uh, okay, so. Yes, uh, so first question, do you also have a base of sensors that we can select and connect with boards? Uh, actually, we do. We do have a range of uh, SPI I2C sensors, ranging from uh, temperature, pressure sensors, and a lot of, you know, a big range of that. Uh, you would look for the Renode infrastructure repository uh, on the Renode GitHub, and you will find all the peripherals models there. What is What I might just add is that we are currently working on a system that will allow you to feed sensors with timestamp data so that it would allow you to create complex tests when you have a sensor-driven application that receives uh, well data in an organized manner. I hope. I that. think that one yep. one interesting thing to mention is perhaps that we don't currently show sensors in Renodepedia, but I think that would be a great addition, and like uh, that's something we definitely want to do. But so yep. that's kind of where in the future I would envision you would look for. Hey, which sensors can I actually run in Renode? That that's going to be the place to look for them, but they're not there yet. Yeah, if you go to uh, actually take a look at the Arduino Nano uh, REPL file that we generate, there are two sensors there on board already and a camera because we also can do, you know, more complex sensors. Uh, is, there, uh, is there a roadmap for uh, Zinc Ultrascale Plus support? We currently have support for Zinc 7000, uh, which is, uh, yeah, I think, uh, quite uh, interesting. And from the perspective of uh, Peripheral blocks, uh, they're actually very, very similar. And we are able to run modern Linux there. 
uh, yeah, so so there is some support I think right now. To be said for Austria Plus, but, since it's yes. Corex, yeah, Corex A53, I believe, right? It's an ARM64 so, architecture. Yes. We're, we're currently in the process of implementing ARM64 support, yes. which will eventually give us Ultra Scale Plus support. So yeah, this is definitely in progress, uh, though not there yet. But there, there's a roadmap for it. Uh, it's, it's kind of not not very far away future. Just don't expect it next month. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, uh, not. Uh, is there support for uh, NAND memories? Uh, no NAND memories at this moment. We have NORFLASH. We don't have NAND flash yet. Uh, just because we didn't have like specific use case for that, but there is nothing preventing us from doing that. Um, how accurate are uh, CPU models used by Renotepedia? So, uh, well, they they are used by Renote to be precise. Uh, our CPU models can vary in in accuracy. So, if you want to be very accurate, you can have a very related model of your CPU derived directly from RTL. Uh, and yeah, then you can uh, just co-simulate with a cycle accurate model uh, in the later. But our standard approach is to focus on an instruction level. Uh, so yeah, we are, Renote is in its core an instruction set simulator. Uh, so each instruction, you know, behaves as it would on uh, real hardware, but not, does not necessarily take the uh, same uh, time. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, the accuracy from the functional perspective is uh, is I would say precise, uh, but from the time perspective, it kind of depends on you. And you can also mock some if you, if you, for example, working with Risk Five, you can add custom instruction implementations even in Python if you want. Uh, for I2C peripherals, is it possible to connect multiple devices to one master? Uh, yes, they have to have uh, be registered at a uh, they each uh, uh, addresses, respective addresses, but then it is possible. We don't have support for that uh, for SPI yet, but then we will need some kind of chip select. Uh, but yeah, uh, it is possible. Are the CPU models open source? Everything in Renote is open source. So that's uh, that's the main premise of Renote. Nothing is closed source. There is no Renote Pro. Uh, we generally, everything that we have uh, that concerns like, let's say publicly available hardware is public as well. Uh, so yeah, if you download Renote, you get the whole package. And uh, does adding new peripherals require adding a related model? Uh, no, uh, not necessarily. It is possible to co-simulate with related peripherals and that's a relatively new addition to Renote. But the main idea is that we model our peripherals in high level languages, mainly C Sharp. Uh, we have quite a lot of infrastructure that make it very easy. You just define a register interface and you then you rely on our uh, abstractions that, for example, well, creating a timer or UART is mainly defining a register interface and uh, interrupt behavior, and that's it. And you would do that mostly in C-sharp. You can also do Python. We have experiment in Rust, uh, and generally any any language that you can compile to native code should be uh, possible to be used in that way. Uh, very related models are OK as well, but yeah, C-sharp is the, let's say, uh, number one uh, approach here. Uh, yeah, and that it would be great to have NAND uh, someday. I agree, definitely. Uh, hopefully, we will. Have, I, we don't have it uh, in a, like a very direct timeline, but but there is uh, this topic pops up from time to time. So yeah, we'll hopefully have it soon. Um, yeah, I think that these are all of the questions that we had. Yeah. Okay, I was able to share. Obviously, you had a chance to, to kind of take a look at the links. And uh, thank you for all the great questions. It's uh, certainly a rabbit hole uh, <laughs> because there's lots of things we do support. There's lots of things we still have to support. Um, but yeah, as, as mentioned, uh, many things are actually coming or in the works. And I'm very excited for Cortex A 53 and up that we're going to support uh, in, in some kind of not too far away future. 
that should open up a lot of interesting use cases. And perhaps I'll also make a reference to Zephyr, where Zephyr itself is also kind of trying to migrate up to bigger devices as well. I mean, of course, it's, it's supporting all the small ones. Uh, and it will be doing that for, for, for the future too, but um, it's a very scalable system. So it's not limited to those small devices. So uh, that's, that's a very fortunate uh, thing because of course, as Zephyr supports more platforms, so can we kind of support more and get the data out, generate the necessary rep files and yeah. And we definitely have to mention that Zephyr also supports Renode and with Twister, you can run tests directly in Renode for uh, certain platforms. And we will of course be aiming to, to increase that coverage in the future. And the other question is whether will the slides be available? The answer is of course, uh, yes, they will be. Perfect. Well, thank you, Michael and Peter and for everyone for dialing in. Um, as noted, uh, recording uh, as, well as the slides will be made available shortly and so we'll we'll get that posted uh, for all in attendance and those unable to join today uh, thanks again thank you all great to have you bye